everyone, today's video is going to be on the principles of lung slash thoracic surgery for the general surgery resident. This will be a very broad overview and really focus on what are the key differences between your typical post-operative general surgery patient and your um, thoracic surgery patient. And we're going to kind of divide up these differences, focusing on differences in pre, intra, and post-operative care. So first, Preoperative, we got to think about patient selection a little bit differently in these patients. As you know, in general surgery, we often use a test, you know, we, we assess METs, right? If you can do, perform greater than four METs, usually you have the cardiopulmonary reserve to tolerate general anesthesia and surgery. However, a lot of these patients are going to be so limited by their shortness of breath that they have, you know, long-standing COPD or other lung issues that you won't be able to assess their metabolic function, or they won't be able to complete four METs, but that might be related to their lungs as opposed to their heart. So a lot of these patients will need a cardiac stress test pre-op if you can't get a good sense of do they stress their heart enough to see if they have angina or et cetera with four METs of activity. However, independent of that sort of cardiac clearance for surgery, we have to think about pulmonary clearance. Um, and that's typically done using PFTs as part of the preoperative clearance strategy. So the two PFT values that you really need to focus on are the FEV1 and the DLCO. So in the alphabet soup of those PFDs, don't worry about reading the entire thing, scrolling through the whole thing. What you need to seek out for your preoperative uh, thoracic surgery patients are the FEV1 and the DLCO. And now the PFT criteria where somebody's considered adequate for lobectomy or removing an entire lobe, which is probably the most common operation we do when we're resecting lungs. If they have an FEV1 greater than 80% and a DLCO greater than 80%, um, both of those, then they are thought to have enough pulmonary reserve to tolerate a lobectomy. Now, if either of those are less than 80%, you should cal calculate a predicted post-operative value for both of those. And the big picture of how you do that is you say, okay, I know the lung has around 19 segments, and I'm going to be, with my operation, with my lobectomy, I'm going to take out X number of segments. So in this case, if you're taking out three segments, then afterwards, I'll know I'll be left with 16 out of 19 segments. So I take 16 over 19, and I multiply it by my preoperative values to get my predicted postoperative values for both FEV1 and DLCO. Another quick way is to think that each segment is roughly 5% since 100 divided by 19 is around 5, 100 divided by 20, of course, um, but either way. Once you have those post predicted postoperative values, uh, if your FEV1 is greater than 60% and your postoperative predicted DLCO is also greater than 60%, you are again thought to have adequate pulmonary reserve to undergo a lobectomy. However, if you're less than 60%, this is where it gets a little bit complex. So if you're kind of in this middle zone between 30 to 60%, either the post-op predicted FEV1 or DLCO, then you need at least informal exercise testing, either via a walk or stair test. Your institutional criteria will be set as far as what a pass is. Uh, but if you pass that test, you're considered low risk, you can proceed. However, if you fail, you're going to need a formal CPET or cardiopulmonary exercise testing, which we'll talk about in this lower section, which is also the section for if your post-op predicted value is less than 30% for either FEV1 or DLCO, then you absolutely need to undergo formal cardiopulmonary exercise testing, which will give you a VO2 max value. If your VO2 max value is greater than 75%, low risk, 35 to 75%, moderate risk, less than 35%, high risk, and that will just inform whether or not this patient is a good enough candidate for surgery, maybe the extent of surgery you might offer if you try to do something a little bit less uh, invasive, um, or even considering other options such as SBRT uh, for lung cancer uh, or just definitive chemo radiation. All right, so now we've used our PFTs uh, to help select our preoperative patients. Now we need to briefly review our surgical anatomy of the lung. So remember, big picture, so this is right and left on the screen. We've got our lobes of the lung. So the right lung has three lobes, one, two, three, or the upper, middle, and lower lobes. While the left, remember that side has the heart on it, it only has two lobes. It's got the upper lobe and the lower lobe. Um, it's got this kind of extension of the upper lobe called the lingula, which is sort of a quasi-middle lobe um, as far as the left side goes. And then those lobes are also divided up into segments. And again, we talked about this before, but there's 19 segments, so there's 10 segments on the right side. These are not all shown in this picture because it's 3D anatomy, of course. And then nine on the left side. Now, thinking about the bronchi that feed these segments, again, we've got right and left here. Um, remember that this is a trachea coming down and we branch into right and left. Notice how it's more of a straight shot down the right. The left has a little bit more angle to it. So people typically aspirate down um, 
the right main stem bronchus as opposed to the left. And then also note that there's kind of three major takeoffs on the right, right upper, right middle, you can't really see coming forward, right lower, and left we have just upper and lower. And then you'll be doing a lot of bronchoscopy in thoracic surgery. And the way you kind of orient yourself with bronchoscopy, this is coming down, looking down the trachea. You should know that the trachea has incomplete cartilaginous rings. So you see how there's no cartilage back here. That's kind of the membranous or muscular portion of the trachea. And that is posterior. So if you're coming down the trachea and you orient yourself to that, this is posterior. If I know that's posterior and I know this is right and this is left. And the other confirmation test you can do is drive into the right main stem bronchus and that will have a very quick take up takeoff of the right upper lobe bronchus. Um, whereas on the left, you have to go a little bit farther uh, to reach that takeoff point. Another aspect of surgical anatomy and kind of surgical decision-making that can come across as a bit complex is the lymph nodes associated with thoracic surgery. Um, I actually never really memorized these lymph node stations. I think uh, most general surgeons probably don't need to, but you do need to know some basic principles. And they're usually labeled with a number followed by right or left. So example, 2R or 4L. And the R or L just stands for right or left. So that's one good thing to get off the bat. And then another easy rule to remember is that the single digit numbers are your central nodes in the middle and all your double digit numbers are out more laterally. So kind of the mediastinal nodes, two and four and seven, those are all single digits. And then out here, more in the hilum, and out into the lung, we have like 10, 11, 12, et cetera. So that will help you just kind of get a big picture of the nodal stations you're talking about. And then finally, remember that there is a ton of other stuff in the chest. And as well as most general surgeons know, uh, intra-abdominal anatomy, um, there's a whole lot of anatomy we don't think about except when we're on our thoracic rotation. So just remember that you know, every step in the chest is a bit fraught and there's tons of other anatomy that can be damaged and have significant long-term complications for the patient. I mean, obviously there's the heart and the other large blood vessels that you can't forget about the recurrent laryngeal nerves coming in here in the center um, of the chest that can of course lead to issues with your vocal cords. There's an esophagus that you don't want to touch unless of course you're doing an esophagectomy. There's a thoracic duct running back here that can lead to chyle leaks. Um, there's a sympathetic ganglion back there in the back, et cetera, et cetera. So there's definitely a ton of anatomy to review uh, when you're going to do your thoracic cases. All right, now getting more to the OR itself, let's talk briefly about patient positioning. So usually we're operating on one side of the lung, uh, uh, the chest cavity or the other thorax. So for example, this patient would be positioned in left lateral decubitus with their right side here up. So we'd be operating on the right chest in this case. When you're thinking about positioning, you want the break of the bed here to be about at the patient's greater trochanter because you will eventually bring the bed down that way to open or break the bed in that way to open up the space between these ribs uh, to get more working space. Uh, and note that for these thoracic surgeries, you are going to be having the patient intubated with a dual lumen um, ET tube, which allows them to ventilate the two sides of the, the thorax independently. So you can collapse the lung when you're working on this side of the chest. Um, this is another reason why the patients need to have a reasonable part pulmonary reserve to tolerate being ventilated on only one lung for a certain amount of time. And then even when we're placing ports and doing VATS, which is video assisted thoracoesophagic surgery, the equivalent of MIS surgery in the abdomen or laparoscopic surgery, uh, when you're doing that, you actually don't need to, although sometimes you will insipate blood gas into the chest, because if you think about it, you have stiff ribs holding the chest wall out here, and then you collapse the lung, you actually automatically get working space even without necessarily using CO2. The other big consideration to think about with VATS and placing ports is the uh, neurovascular location of the chest wall. So remember, we have our ribs, this is outside, and this is inside the body, right? And this is kind of the head or cranial, and this is caudal down here. And so when we're looking at the rib, the superior aspect of the rib is safe, but the inferior aspect is where the neurovascular bundle runs. So you want your incisions, um, you want your port placement uh, to avoid the neurovascular bundle as much as possible, both of course for just neurovascular injury, but also uh, thinking about things like post-op pain. Uh, you can get a lot of pain related to a port that's placed too close and then compresses the nerve all throughout the operation. They can get a lot of post-operative nerve pain. All right, briefly reviewing our surgical options for lung resections. It's kind of like liver resections, if you're familiar with their, those. So you have the options always to do a wedge, which is a non-anatomic resection where you just have a lesion somewhere in the lung and you just go to that lesion and kind of staple around it, just take a little wedge of it out. And then you have your 
anatomic resections, where certain segments that are in easily accessible locations, uh, like the apical segment of the upper lobes or the superior segment of the lower lobes, can be stapled off in isolation away from the other lobes. But certainly the most common is going to be a lobectomy, where you're taking out a whole lobe. Uh, and then finally, a pneumonectomy is where you take out an entire lung, often not well tolerated and pretty rarely done nowadays, certainly relative to the other operations. And then sleeve um, is basically an operation that I would recommend looking up a couple pictures of, but it's basically if you have a cancer that's invading a proximal airway, you can take out that airway and then hook up the lung um, distal to that airway back to the main tree and spare a lot of lung tissue that way. All right, now we've talked about surgery. Now some post-operative considerations that are unique to the thoracic patient. First off is just, they're always gonna come out with chest tubes. This helps prevent catastrophic post-operative pneumothorax, which can often happen with a little bit of lung injury during these thoracic surgeries or some oozing of air from the staple line. And of course, clears out any post-operative hemothorax. Um, so you can go see our chest tube management video about how these tubes are managed post-operatively, but just know that all your patients will have it. Um, when it comes to hemothorax, know that that typically comes from port site bleeding. So make sure you have really good uh, hemostasis at your port sites prior to leaving the OR uh, because you don't want to be seeing that hemothorax accumulate in your chest tube and having to go back acutely post-op. And chest tubes will also cause patients a lot of pain. Um, some of our attendings describe it as getting stabbed in the side with a spear and then they leave the spear in when you wake up from surgery, when you have this big plastic chest tube under the ribs. And so you're often going to need some more options than the typical kind of acetaminophen, plus or minus NSAIDs, depending on the patient tolerance, plus or minus a narcotic, which is kind of our typical cocktail for general surgery patients. We'll often add things um, like cryoablation during the surgery uh, can do a great job of numbing those nerves up for a long time, providing good pain control. There's, of course, local anesthetics with blocks and things like that, or epidurals that anesthesia can do. You can use muscle relaxants like tizanidine, et cetera, or um, medications for neuropathic pain can often be quite effective, like pregabalin or gabapentin. Some nice things about thoracic patients, they usually don't have an ileus. You can usually feed these patients immediately post-op, and they can take oral meds, which gives you a lot more options when it comes to those pain control issues. Um, and then when we think about ileus keeping general surgery patients in the hospital, usually the limiting factor for these thoracic patients is going to be pain control and then getting the chest tubes out or some sort of like prolonged air leak issue with the chest tubes that keep them in the hospital. Then one final consideration is a lot of these patients get transient AFib. You know, if you're manipulating the lung, you're kind of by default manipulating the lung vasculature, which of course is directly attached to the heart where AFib generates. Uh, so this is often transient and might be managed a little bit differently by your thoracic surgeons than by your typical general surgeons. You'll often see that in your thoracic patients. All right, so big review. Um, or big topics. So for our brief review, pre-op, the real unique thing is to know your PFTs, know that algorithm for working up um, the FEV1 and DLCO and deciding if the patient needs additional pulmonary testing prior to their basic PFTs before surgery. Intraop, remember there's a lot of unique anatomy to study and learn um, in the thorax. Make sure you're avoiding those neurovascular bundles um, inferior to the ribs and choose an appropriate lung resection strategy, which is based on a combination of the patient's pathology, but also what their PFTs show that they can tolerate. And then finally, post-op, just know that your real focus is going to be chest tube management and controlling your patient's pain. All right, that's all for today. These videos are for educational purposes only. Do not use to diagnose or treat any diseases. Uh, this is not clinical advice, and we will see you next time.